It's a great honor to have been allotted 30 minutes to summarize 70 years of uh, work in my general relativity for the society. In case I happen to overshoot by, I suggest that you look at a number of my recent postings, as well as my recently published autobiography, Force in the Road by World Scientific. That was a plug. Okay, so let me know. I've been asked to, in particular to address six points. So the first one I will address as part of a more general picture, which is, how did I start? When I came to graduate school at Harvard in 1949 and got my PhD in 53, the word general relativity was never, never mentioned by anyone whatsoever during that whole period including the course I took called Relativity. It simply would not on the map. Thereafter, I came to the Institute for Advanced Study, which is where Oppenheimer advised all of us new postdocs to have nothing to do with an old fool down the hall. Technically, he was right in that by that point, Einstein was unfortunately completely lost in his own little world. But that's like saying Newton was an old fool when he was master of the mint. Einstein was, after all, the greatest of this century. And indeed, Oppenheimer's one immortal paper is in general relativity. <laughs> so it seems a bit ironic. In any case, his dictum was not difficult to follow since A, I didn't know what general relativity was, B, Einstein was never his mysterious office and so on, nobody knew where he was. However, during my second year, towards the close of my second year, I got a hot tip that Einstein would be talking and then he would give these seminars occasionally in an unmarked room somewhere in the Institute. And I stumbled into it, and there he was. In German, he talked for an hour on his latest calculation. Since I wouldn't have known his second latest calculation either, it was pure tourism on my part. But that is indeed <coughs> the story of the old fool. I think it was one of Oppenheimer's many unwise remarks. I had met, or rather cowered in the back of the Institute van once when in Eisenhower, when <clears throat> Einstein and I shared it during a rainstorm, but we had no connection otherwise. So this was in the, just before Einstein died, early spring of 1955. Which brings me to the next historical requested moment, which is my recollections of GRG0 and what GR1, as they are now known. So GR0 was the first, although it didn't know it was the first, of a series of international general relativity conferences. It had been set up for 1955 for the obvious reason that it marked 50 years of special, 40 years of general relativity and was held fittingly enough in Bern. And at that point I was a I had begun another stint as a postdoc in the Niels Bohr Institute where the word general relativity was equally totally unknown. But I thought I had a card. I was touring around Europe and I thought it might be fun to be another tourist this time. So what turned out to be GR0 was held in the Bern Natural History Museum, and we had to go through a whole 
cases of stuffed primates in order to get to the auditorium where a bunch of equally not stuffed but pretty old primates all the old gr generation which i thought of only as <laughs> names in textbooks they were all there fucker and violin fuck and all sorts of the relativity connected great Pauli. Pauli incidentally was perhaps the first person <coughs> to understand general relativity at the age of 18 when uh, he wrote a book about it. There's a famous anecdote where uh, Eddington, who was of course a very, a very arrogant character who was asked by reporters, uh, Professor Eddington, they say there are only three people who generally understand general relativity, to which Eddington replied, who's the third? And of course, Pauli was ahead of him. In any case, there were four of us, as I wrote in my memoir, <clears throat> who were under the age of whatever it was, 90, and that was Felix Pirani, who was the only genuine relativist, and the other two, Wally Gilbert and um, John Moffat, were doing other things just like I. So we congregated for obvious bosonic reasons, since there was no other person of any age near ours. And uh, of course, I learned nothing except stand in awe of all these people. So that's that was GR0, and what is now popularly known as GR1 was held in Chapel Hill in January 57, in which I had flew back from Copenhagen to attend because I was job hunting at that point, <clears throat> and I then, people always talk about Feynman being there and giving a historic lecture. It was not really very historic, but I made the mistake of giving a completely nonsense lecture about general relativity as a po possible universal cutoff to the problems of quantum field theory in the ultraviolet. And he rightly took me, tore me to pieces, which managed it was probably unrelated, but then I got the worst flu I ever had in my life. And he came to visit me, I guess, out of some kind of feeling that he had caused it. So he came to my room all the time. So that was GR1. And then, and then, although it doesn't seem to be counted officially, there came Royaumont in the summer of um, 58, was it? Yes. Uh, so 50, January 57, summer 58, Wyoming was a newly established, um, there was an abbey near Paris in which meetings were supposed to be held. And it was at that point that uh, the beginnings of ADM were presented, which brings me having gone, oh yeah, well, let me just go through another GR, the next GR, the real GR was held in Warsaw, the summer of 62, or rather in a place called Yablona, which was the Versailles of Warsaw, and attended by all sorts of greats, including Dirac and good old Feynman and me. Uh, so I should, yeah, so let me talk about, because after all, it was a central point in my career, ADM, as I was asked to discuss its origins and its um, after, meaning and aftermath. And the origins are rather amusing. After my Copenhagen stay. I came back as a, an instructor to Harvard for a year 
and were some of the then fashionable <coughs> dispersion theory. It was worth a year, but no more. At the end of that, quantum field theory, then it's quantum electrodynamics at the time, was sort of played out. And uh, Dick Arnowith, who had been one of my close graduate school classmates, and I started thinking about what would be the next good thing to do. Well, since QFT was gone, that was spin one and zero and spin a half had been played out and spin three halves could never have been thought of as yet. It was a time was not ripe. I'll come back to that. Came, so we thought next step is spin two. And we knew in a very vague way that that must have something to do with general relativity. So we set about with all our brilliant Schwinger, my PhD advisor, to whom we will also return. I set about, Dick and I set about using all the machinery we had learned, all the formal stuff. We set about uh, trying to use it at least on the linearized theory. Now the history of that was that Pauli and Fiertz, or Fiertz and Pauli in the early 30s, had attacked it with the, the then available artillery, as well as a guy called Matvey Bronstein in St. Petersburg, or in Leningrad, I should say, <coughs> about 35. Poor Bronstein shared the last day with Trotsky and a similar fate as well. He was one of the early victims of the terror, Stalin's terror right guy. So what Dick and I did was to attack the free spin two field. That is the same level that Fierce, Pauli, and Bronstein did, but in modern language. And we managed a paper, which at the time was not unreasonable, <laughs> explaining its properties. So Dick and I, after everything had been done, tried to think of what the next interesting step might be. Spin zero, spin a half, spin one, we were all exhausted. This was still pre-Yang Mills, but post-QED. Spin three halves was yet to come, as I will discuss. That left, uh, at that point, spin two, which he and I knew, vaguely knew, was better known as uh, general relativity's linear approximation. And we used all the formal tools we had learned from Julian Schwinger, who was our advisor, be on different topics, PhD topics, uh, to disanalyze and formalize the free spin two field. And we were reasonably satisfied, in fact, we called it number Roman numeral one in the hope that someday. So in those days when you did something and one or two, there was no archive, no internet. So what you did was send mimeographed, almost illegible copies to a number of labs, which you thought worthy of having it. And they would have racks with displays. They would change every week. So one of the places we sent it to was Princeton. And at that point, Wheeler, John Archibald Wheeler, was himself waking up to general relativity. And he got interested in the paper and summoned us to Princeton. For once, we were there not just as a postdoc or a tourist, but uh, to dispense research results. And he said he, he had a habit that everyone who knew him still remembered. He had beautiful bound rag paper notebooks lined and bound. 
and he had a tape recorder, which in those days was the size of a battleship. <laughs> and he started talking to us. And as he heard us, he said, hold it right there. I have a very bright student who might be very relevant to what you're telling us. So he brought in this kid called Charlie Misner. I'd actually met him at Chapel Hill, but didn't really know him. So Charlie sat there. We said our bit. And then Charlie pointed out what he knew, what he had done. He had, and this was, of course, he was a genuine relativist. So what he had done was find a really amazing formulation of general relativity. He didn't quite know what it meant, but there he had it. And Dick and I looked at each other, and then Wheeler said, you know, the three of you might want to collaborate on further work. And we were not about to connect with a lousy graduate student just for that. So we said we will, Errolly said we will think about it. And by the time our train got to Princeton Junction, we said, what idiots we are. Of course, we got to get them. So this is how the M was added to ADM. And there began, this was the beginning of ADM, which lasted from the 1950, well, this was a 57, the spring of 58 through 61 or 62 and became a cornucopia of a dozen different original papers in all directions, which we think, I still think is one of the, is probably the greatest advance in GR since Einstein, because it de-geometrized general relativity and analyzed it as a field theory, now, as is well known, today's breakthrough is tomorrow's calibration. So nowadays, many people think of ADM as a great numerical relativity tool. And by the way, this is because it's a three plus one formulation. That is to say, Hamiltonian form of the theory. So that lends itself best for numerical as against analytical uh, studies. However, that is the most unjust or the least interesting and important part of ADM. So I will perhaps expand a tiny bit on its significance and the results it led to. So first of all, we discovered that the full theory, now not linearized approximation, but the full theory viewed as a field theory was what is called, what we call the already parameterized theory. And I have to explain. In the late 19th century, Jacobi, well-known mathematician, made what seemed like a step backwards in dynamics. And he pointed out <clears throat> that if you took a, say, a, a single particle action, and time in those days was just Newtonian, of course, you could turn it into a general covariant theory, formally, by turning the Hamiltonian uh, uh, as a constraint and a time as an undetermined gen generic thing, that is to say, you went from the, you added a degree of freedom, and at the same time you added a constraint which canceled each other out. And uh, you could just go backwards, of course, to the ordinary Newtonian uh, description of a particle, whatever you had. However, in the case of general relativity, it was already parameterized and there was no way back. That is, there was no unique 
of course, space or time coordinate to appeal to, since the theory is intrinsically generally covariant. And so you took a take your pick yourself of what frame to use. And this is what underlies much of the complexity and confusion behind understanding the theory. So, starting from that point of view, that is to say of GR as an already parameterized theory, we explored not least, but most perhaps the what is most uh, memorable in addition to exhibiting the existence of gravitational waves unambiguously, was a definition of energy. Now that was no joke because after Einstein's GR, no lesser pair than Hilbert and Emmy Noether tried to define it. Being mathematicians, they failed because they were too general and didn't realize that you could only define gravity general energy if you had asymptotic flatness. Okay. Solution, it didn't fall off at infinity. You, know, you neither could nor should define energy for it. So we managed a beautiful full definition known to this day as A, DM, which uh, exactly did right. That is to say, it exists and it is precisely the correct and unique definition. There is no density, there's no meaningful energy density definition in GR because general covariance, but only with asymptotically flat conditions, boundary conditions. And uh, that actually, and I have to say, let us, uh, much later, I'll talk about positive energy. But anyway, so ADM has had enormous conceptual to me, I mean, yeah, it seems to me kind of value and that it's also used as a numerical tool as all to the good, but we could explore standard quantization possibilities, gravitational radiation, which we nailed down in every possible respect. And, and we wrote, as I say, a dozen papers, which we summarized in uh, we summarize them in a uh, uh, chapter now non-existent book, but it's been on now. It's been reprinted in archives, so you can find it. So now that brings me to the next subject. Uh, I've been asked to talk about the great people I've known. But before that, maybe I should talk about supergravity because we're talking physics here. So supergravity was invented by Bruno Zumino and me in 1976 as, as at the same time and independently of uh, proved by using computers by Friedman Ferrara and Hebenheisen. And we did it in a couple of lines because this involved the spin three halves field. Now that's a very interesting animal, which had actually <coughs> been invented, or this guy not invented, but been formalized by Marita and Schwinger in 1941 and independently in the Soviet Union by, uh, Ginsburg, Vitaly Ginsburg. And I simply cannot trace that paper. It was a short letter written in the middle of during the bad phase of the war in the Soviet Union. And then Buchdahl discovered that the spin three halves field could only exist in a, in a gravitational field 
if that gravitational field was reaching flat. Now that sounded like the death knell because that meant it could only be a test field and indeed there couldn't be any sources for it to, other sources for it to exist or the world would not be reaching flat, it would have sources. And when I came to CERN on April 1st, 1976, Bruno Zumino was waiting for me and we started discussing and I said, I had thought about, you know, I mean, didn't know the word supergravity, discussing the question of how could it be salvaged or not? And he said, well, remember, there are things called fierce identities, which I will not burden you with, but they are identities between products of spinners, quantized, necessarily second quantized. And we set about to see whether the symmetry of spin three halves in flat space, which is a gauge of variance of the second kind that reduces the four possible degrees, so the helicities, the two helicities, three plus or minus three halves. And it went beautifully smoothly because we both do a great, totally forgot the work by Hermann Klein, Hermann Weil, I mean Hermann Weil, who talked about torsion for different ways of coupling fermionic fields to gravity. So our proof was just a few lines and uh, it led to the proof the one proof by Teitelbaum and me about a year later of positivity of general of gravity of the ADM energy, which as I said, it was a, a really, and I had slaved away on that problem with many other people for many years. And we did it, we did it in two lines using, because we showed that since supergravity, that spin three halves was the square root of gravity. Gravity was positive. I won't go into details, but that was another fallout. Okay, so let me now jump to great people I have known. I'm supposed to give you a history, or at least the names. So Julian Schwinger was the first one. He, of course, knew everything when he was a kid although, as I say, he never mentioned the word general relativity. But after ADM, he worked on it a little bit again. And after supergravity, he came back again. So he was one. And then, of course, I mentioned Einstein and Pauli. And uh, Feynman worked on various aspects, although I think there was really nothing that he did that was of original value something called ghosts in quantizing, uh, perturbative quantization, general relativity. Uh, then there were Rob Born, uh, Miller and Rosenfeld, both of whom were workers in the field, and they did share one particular failing, which was they were two of, Dyson was the third, who felt general relativity need not be, should not, and need not be quantized. And that was a major mistake. They were wrong. And in fact, I just written a little paper showing on elementary grounds why you had to quantize it. So that was too. Miller was, of course, in Copenhagen when I was there, but we never, the word relativity never came up. Rosenfeld used to visit there likewise. And I knew Bryce DeWitt, of course, from way back from before Chapel Hill, and he was single-mindedly devoted to one thing, which is quantizing in theory, in incredibly complicated formalism. Uh, whom else? Though I should, of course, mention Dirac. Now, Dirac turned out to be ADM's closest rival. He 
came along for totally different reasons and being derived. And then it came to roughly the same definitions as ADM, although he didn't quite work it out as far. But that was his perhaps last big thing. That was in the late 50s. He was at Wyoming, as I said, and in Warsaw. Let's see, who else? Uh, I mean, I knew all the old guys from Infeld to oh, Rosen, uh, all of Einstein's collaborators, Bergman, Bergman. But I think neither, none of those have really left any major impression. So let me, I'm running over time, let me finish. I've been asked to say some final words. Of course, have to be final words. So I would say quantum gravity, quantization, general relativity remains, that consistent, remains one of the great, the great unsolved problem, the unification of quantum mechanics and general relativity. Perhaps and of course, it means that we really are not understanding. There's some obviously deeper layer on the Wilson, Ken Wilson, which will allow us to unify the two in some meaningful way. However, as a, an effective theory, it has no peers. Its predictions have all been correct all the way down the line. And uh, despite all the new, spate of gravitational radiation results that are on, on that was were discovered by <coughs> LIGO and company not a single flaw has been found so let me close on that note it's the greatest wrong theory that was ever invented and one of the greatest achievements of the human mind that liberated space time from being just a lousy background to being a dynamical actor. So there are, in fact, there are now no inert. It's all of physics is dynamical. I will end on that and good luck for future GR. Thank you.